That's actually live, what we call live bottom. If the bottom was just solid red with no little things on top of it, it's not nearly as good of a spot because it's not living, living bottom, living corals. And there's definitely, and I run garments on my boat, there's some settings to change that'll help really identify what you're looking at on the bottom. And a, another example, for instance, is if I'm running across the bay, I can tell if it's sand or mud based on how deep the red is. And I, I'm, I hope that slides in here somewhere. Yeah, I think I know the one you want. We'll just, I'll just flip over and get that one. Um, and I think, I mean, you, even then that one that with the split screen, with the split zoom that you have in it, um, is important enough for, uh, yeah, there it is. So, learning to use your electronics. You know, if you're not using your split zoom function, you need to. So what we're looking at here is a piece of bottom that's in 210 feet of water. Now I want y'all to ignore this side of the screen as best you can. Most people would drive up on this piece of bottom and they would just keep on going to the next spot. And I can pull right in there behind you and catch fish. Now this run, this particular one happens not to be a mingo spot, but it's a good representation. All this here, on this side, we're only looking at the bottom 30 feet. And it looks a whole lot different than this little bitty marking here. But unlike when you're on a wreck, you got the wreck sticking up from the bottom and all the fish up above. It's easy to see. Anybody can tell that there's something there. Well, on this type of bottom, and like I say, this happens, this is going to be groupers in the next picture I'll show you, but it can be the same thing can happen with mingos. They're up underneath the little edges and the rocks and the corals, and they're up underneath all that stuff. And as you, there's enough here with the fuzzies that I see here, plus these few fish, that we're going to stop and fish. Well, the same exact spot, 10 minutes later, there's that many groupers on TV. So this is, the, I think a lot of our good Mingo stuff looks very similar. There's a much. lot of fuzzies um, that turn into a great show. And even a lot, um, I think about some of the closer to Destin Pass, the near shore, um, I don't want to give away perfect examples of stuff because if I go fish it and all of you guys are sitting on it with your boats, it'll be frustrated. Well, Friend Juice is a big area that would hold. And yeah, exactly. You get there and you know that there's probably fish somewhere and you don't necessarily see them on the chart plotter, but you see the fuzzies and you see... Do you have a better word to call it? No. And now it's a thing now with their fuzzies now. I don't care. Um, but when you get there and, you, and I'm looking at the chart plotter and for me, I mean, you can tell I'm talking about it now on my boat, especially. I'm like, trust me, here's what you're going to see. I have my chart set up this way, so it's going to be cool. And we get there and there's nothing but fuzzies. I'm like, and everyone's like, yeah, cool. Yeah, you know what you're talking about. I'm like, just put your baits in the water. And then you look back a couple minutes later and I'm, I'm laughing. I'm like, now look at the chart. And the whole thing is just full because I think here like you always say they're underneath stuff but on some of those big reefs they're moving around yeah and they may be they may be moving around or they may be down in one of the little gullies um and they'll just once you stop they'll come to you do you have an a-scope example on there yeah perfect so if and we've talked about this a lot and i don't want to digress too much into the electronic side because i'll talk about this the last one, when I talked about electronics, we talked for like two and a half hours yeah. and we should talk about catching mingos and triggers, I guess. But shameless plug, I also teach Garmin seminar or on boat training for these. So if you have any questions afterwards, I'll tell you all about it. But basically on this sonar, this column, for those of you who might not fully understand all this, Garmin's have a thing called A-scope where the A-scope is actually the physical return instantly of what's underneath the boat. So in this column, that's actually what's happening under the boat. You can see it says 21 feet. Sonar comes out in a cone and that 21 feet is the diameter of the cone at the bottom. So obviously if you're in deeper water, that cone gets bigger. So you can kind of see what's actually happening and all of this is history. So if you go back to the fuzzies, I'm sorry, one more. 
what I think happened here was whoever was driving this boat was driving over it, saw it, looped back around, kind of caught the edge of it, came back around, saw it, and then finally marked right over it. So it's just, it just kind of helps when you guys are driving around on the boat to know what you're looking at, to position yourself in the right spot to actually be on the fish. Yeah. Absolutely. Go away. And I don't want to get into heading sensors and oh, you don't compass want. caliber, unless you, unless you want to. Unless kind of, so on this one. Perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Let's do it. And I, yes, I love some, talking about I stuff. I like even that. added some new stuff in there for you. Um, you know, something that can make your life easier. If you do not have either a vessel that has like Helm Master System, where you have the joystick and fish point to hold you in place. Um, having a trolling motor, if you don't have one, you need something. Otherwise, one person, it's very difficult to hold a single engine boat in place, even if you're good. But even on a twin engine boat, if you don't have either a trolling motor or a helm master, you as the captain or somebody has to be at the wheel all the time. You can't fish, you can't help anybody because it doesn't take but 30 seconds and you're, the wind or the currents pushed you off the spot. And now we gotta go spend five minutes trying to get back on it again. So encourage you to get one of those. Um, I think- I don't the, wanna do that, do I wanna do that one? The addition of a trolling motor and the way these electronics can be set up now, I think and I, I use this over the weekend a whole lot, and there's no science behind this at all. This statistic is completely made up, but more fish have been caught since the invention of a trolling motor and good sonar than all of history combined before that. Um, again, it's not accurate at all, but it just seems like, and I think it's gonna have a huge impact in regulations, or I think we've already seen that. Yeah. Um, just because of the amount of fish you can catch now, when I pull up to a spot, well, well, you can turn, it, anybody can become a captain now with el the correct electron. You know, if you got a trolling motor, a good sonar and a good GPS, anybody, and then what we're gonna talk about next, anybody can be a charter boat captain. And, and you use the saying, if you and I pull up on a boat and I don't have a trolling motor or fish point or something like that. And you can flip flop this either way. If one of the two of us has it and one doesn't the other is going to outfit will outfish each other at least 10 to 1 and maybe 20 to 1. Um, and it doesn't matter which one of us is on the boat that doesn't have it um unless i mean it, like a, if you look at like a party boat or a head boat who's got yeah. a designated captain who sits upstairs on the sticks the whole time like tim's <laughs> but, but for me i'm not staying on the sticks i'm you can tell i'm a little uh could only use that pipe for drinking, for <laughs> yeah. breathing. I'm a little excited when I get out there on the water, so I'm not really wanting to stand still at the helm all day. And <clears throat> as I add on to your Garmin, there's, it used to be uh, Blue Charts G3 Vision, and now it's, then it was Navionics, Navionics Vision Plus. Plus, and now it's just Navionics Plus. The Garmin has uh, acquired Navionics. Well, this gives you a 3D detailed picture of the bottom. And all these rocks and ledges and uh, natural bottom areas that we keep talking about, well, normally it takes you years and years and years and years to figure this all out. Well, for $250, they just give it to you. Because I'm gonna show you this next slide. And this just happens to be some little places I have out here. You can see that they're close to a contour line right here. And that's a very typical fishing chart plotter setup, right? I'm sure you guys have all, I mean, most a lot of you guys probably are running something that looks just like this, just to get close to your number. But you could never go out here this stuff right here is, this is 60 miles from home. You could not just go randomly out there and you're not just gonna go find this without 50 years of experience. But once you install this 3D bottom feature, like I said, there's a contour line right here. 
Now tell me why the spots are good. They're sitting right on a break. Well, that break doesn't show up on a fishing chart, but it shows up on the 3D bottom imagery. Um, it's 250 a year. This this is stuff that we don't even sell. I mean, I don't, we don't sell it. Uh, you got to get it from Garmin, but it's 250 for the, your first year, and then they do yearly updates at $125. You don't have to do the yearly updates, um, but it just gives you each year they there's more and more bottom being scanned. Yeah, everyone sees that subscription feature and they're like, I'm not paying for my charts every year. But once you download your initial data and or like when the years of it day 364 download your update and then what you already have will still be there yep um the next two things and i have then i have that one too now Ooh. so Whoa. um i'm sure everyone has that doesn't have some some of y'all may have this because you may have autopilot you may have already purchased one of the two but another thing that Garmin has is our heading sensors. And you know, when, when you're running, your GPS has a good idea of where your boat's pointed because it's moving so fast. But when you really slow down and you start to look for your place, you notice your little boat starts to spin and do funky things and the little line's pointing over here and your bow's pointing over here. And it's like, where the heck are we? Well, First, they had steady cast, and then they had the newer XD24. Well, no, so the XD, you gotta be careful with how you word it, because there's also a radar. Right. Um, basically, when the boat, there's a GPS position sensor or antenna, and unless it's moving, it doesn't know which direction it's pointing so when you get to super slow speeds i'm sure and i saw one of you guys shaking your head like yeah the boat's spinning around a little bit they came there's external heading sensors now autopilot boats with autopilot typically don't have that because they've got really good antennas and sensors in the boat um, but the there's a couple options you can add on your nema 2000 network to make it to, to solve that and the first was that steady cast which is a hundred and I looked it up today. It's 149, 149. And, um, then the, and it just plugs straight into your NEMA 2000 network. And there's a little bit of calibration you can do. Um, but, and I think it's like a $140 antenna, um, or I'm sorry, heading sensor for another hundred dollars. You can get a 24 XD, which is a position. It's a GPS position and has a built in heading sensor. That's pretty good. So I added a 24 XD on mine, and I hate to admit this, as a boat captain who's supposed to be out there fishing every day, I let my boat sit. I was, I was pretty, I don't want to say burnt out, but I was tired of fishing by the time November came around. My boat sat in the driveway for about six weeks. I turned my boat on just to see how my new 24 XD was working. And that damn thing was almost to the degree exactly what my compass said sitting still in the yard had not moved at all turned it on and it was on so it, it really helps that heading lag as you get to your spot and you're kind of looking around and kayla gets mad at me when i get close to the spot because i'm like oh i think i just drove past it and then i start spinning around and i'm trying to catch up to it and she's like she doesn't get seasick but when i get to my spot and i'm doing little loop-de-loop -loop figure eights looking for the fuzzies um that's so that that for me if i have a boat i will make sure i have that on there and all these little things that we've talked about so far this is going to think something that's going to help you out it doesn't really matter if you're fishing for mingos triggers red snappers amberjack groupers uh chumming for tunas and dolphins it really will help you out with all your different types of fishing um it's not just for this um this is a cool little item that, that we have at the shop. I don't know if everybody knows, as I sit on my little stool sometimes, I'll try to get, make it where y'all can see a little bit too, but over the years, my back is terrible. Um, I've been just, I fished too many rough days. I've just done too many bad things. These little gadgets here, it's called a cheater post. This really, I kind of stuck it in here. It's more for jacks and groupers and bigger snappers, but this thing will save your back. Um, you, instead of holding the rod up and trying to hold it and using these back muscles, you just lay it in this little, in the little groove there and put downward pressure on it and just reel. Really will save your back. 
Or you could just and use something like this so you don't have to hold on to that hard. And you can see. Just how much easier it makes your life. And if you don't have one of these little rod knobs that's on the butt of that rod, that's another one that you're missing. That just looks so hard. <laughs> well, we catch bigger fish on our boat. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> um, and then the last thing we're going to talk about equipment rise are D hookers. If anybody is not familiar with a D hooker, you need to have one of these. It's it, it's a dehooker to get your fish off. It's a hand gaff. It's a picture taking device. Uh, you won't hardly see. And this is how easy this thing works. You pick the fish up by the hook. You're holding the leader. Put downward pressure. Flip. He's off. So for me, I mean, especially if we're on a spot and people are pulling in two mingos at a time in every corner of the boat. I, I mean, you can tell by looking at my hands, the fishing can be tough. I'm tired of grabbing the fish and getting finned or the gill plate coming out to get me. So I have on each corner of my leaning post, one of those hanging up and I use those things nonstop. Well, here's you using it as a gaff. That's just a little snapper. Play again. I did say, I will say too, we had one day where we had pushing 100 pounds maybe 90. he was definitely 90 pound jack and i so i use that not only to take pictures of fish to mainly to de-hook fish but there was a jack and i'm looking over the side of the boat and i'm like oh, oh man we need a gaff and you and i were running another guy's boat yep. and i was like i need a gaff i need a gaff and they're they like well the gaff's stuck to so-and-so's shirt <laughs> and so the troll and lure around it and it, those treble hooks are in his shirt. Now I'm trying to get my knife out of my pocket to get them. De and I was like, I'm not losing this fish. So I kind of had leader in one hand and I was like, I need a gaff. And they were like, it's on his shirt. I was like, well, take his shirt off. I don't rip. I don't care. I need a gaff. We're not going to lose this fish. And all I had was that little hand gaff. It's 16 inches to measure your snapper, but I put, I opened that fish's mouth, kind of jam that thing in his mouth and lipped him and pulled him over the gunnel and he fell onto the deck. I may or may not have broken the hook on that gaff. It wasn't broke, but it was bent really bad. And it's a stainless steel hook. Yeah. Uh, it's a stainless steel nine knot hook that got straightened out. But those, I use those things on my boat. Well, didn't you almost lose a thumb? Yeah. Uh Two springs ago, they almost had to amputate this thumb from finger from fish poisoning. It was real touch and go. I was on IV antibiotics for six weeks. So those little those little glass looking pokers on the end of the dorsal fin, and I think on the the front too. Yeah. Those things will break off if you grab it wrong. It'll break off into your skin and like stick to your bone, and they have to grind your bone down. It's pretty nasty stuff. So for me. I have I have little hand gaps everywhere on my boat. I'm not, I like this too much to, to lose the thumbs. So rigs, there's really, there's two kind of rigs. And they both work the same. One just tangles a little less. This is what is considered by the commercial, like the commercial snapper fishermen. They'll make a rig just like this it's 10 feet long, but where I have one hook coming off the swivel arm, they'll have three arms on each swivel, then make a 10 foot long leader with 30 hooks on it. They call it rat gear. Well, the thing, what's nice about this rig is when you, this one is a lot more time consuming to make. We're gonna pass both of these around. But when this one goes down to the bottom, this will free spin as it goes down and doesn't tangle. That's what makes this one nice. But this one, I'm pretty quick at it and it probably takes me three or four minutes to make one of these. The other one is just a regular old two hook dropper lit rig. Super simple, got a swivel at each end, two hooks. Now on this one, the hooks are snelled on. And the snell is definitely better, but these are looped on. And the one that we're gonna pass around that they're looped on, what I really want you to pay attention to Is there's a right way and a wrong way to loop the hook. The top hook is on correct. The bottom hook with the little card on it, it's incorrect. 
So we'll send these around so everybody can look at them. Just be careful. They are, these are owner <laughs> Mutu hooks. Hooks are sharp. And they are sharp. And you can kind of see it. So we always, we always feed our hooks through the front. And as you, and you can almost see it as I lift up on it right at the last second, it does that turn. And we need to make a video of that so we can have it big. I do this every morning on my boat. They're like, how do you, how do you rig these? I'm like, it always go through the front. And then I, I show them, I'm like, watch, it's just, it's just this little turn at the end. And if it's the other way, guess what? It turns the other way. Um, but if that baits in that fish's mouth, and you get, well, they're circle hooks too. And we never really talk about the difference in circle hooks, but I think probably most people probably know that. Yeah, and you do you do have, for all of our reef fish species, you do have to use circle hooks. And we don't really talk about a size of circle hook. I'd rather talk about a physical size. You'll notice the hooks that are coming around, they're about the size of a nickel. Um, and the reason we don't give you a specific size because it doesn't matter whether we talk about owner hooks or gamagatsus or mustads. I can get you an A dot that's the size of a nickel, and then in, in the same manufacturer, we just change the style of hook a little bit, and an A dot's this big around. So you can't go by that uh, because there is no standard for hook sizing. It's just you know normally a one aught's their small one and a ten aught's their big one. Well. How big was the one op when they started? Well, that's going to determine how big this one gets. I think, isn't it actually the, the distance between the point of the hook? and It's the gap size is it, what defines it, the number. It's gap and to some know. degree. It's about it's, the size of a nickel. <laughs> yeah, to some degree, the gauge of the wire. It, the gauge go, is the hook gets bigger, the gauge of the wire gets bigger also. Because I know like a seven aught owner and an eight aught eagle claw are complete like the yeah the same yeah it's interesting and, you want it, and, and i would suggest buying a quality hook you know the mustad 39960 that's, that's, a, must that's a galvanized tin hook that mustad makes it's what a lot of the charter boats use but they have that they have a paid deckhand and those hooks do not come out of the box sharp they they pay somebody to sit there on the boat and sharpen those hooks well, the hooks that are on the rigs that are going around, those are owner hooks. Well, they're black, they're chemically sharpened and black nickel Teflon coated. So when that hook hit, sticks a fish, or when you take it out of the package, it's sharp. And when it touches something, it's in it. And we'll talk about hooks, how quick a hook can be in you later. Um, that was just stuff to make them. So baits for trigger fish and mingos. Now, everybody's gonna have their favorites. Um, my favorite is cut up bonita chunks. And you can do, you can make your chunks two ways. I used to do it the hard way. And every once in a while you have these moments that are in your head, they're like, God, I wish I'd have thought about that a lot sooner. Or, and I had two stories about that. There's one of the guys that comes to my shop every day. He's, uh, they part of, he's part of my coffee drinking crew in the morning. And he's, a, he's in the construction business, but he's also the one that builds all of our chicken coops for us. Well, me and another buddy, Kevin, are sitting out there talking about, you know, it was springtime a couple of years ago. And we're like, ah, we really got to get out and get our sprinklers working. And I hate doing that in the spring because it's still chilly outside. And I got to put my rain gear on because I want you know, I got to turn the pump on. And this sprinkler's running, but these two are sprinkling me. Well, Joe was like, why are you going to go through all that trouble? Just put a bucket on top of the other two sprinklers. <laughs> well, I used to cut the side of the bonita off just like this. And I would thin it out a little bit. And then I would cut it into strips this way and cut it into strips this way. And then last year, Mark sends me this picture. Wait a second, am I getting credit for a good idea? Yeah. I didn't know where this was going. <laughs> so I was, like, sends, I was like, I was going to sit down and listen to you. He sends me a dang picture, and I'm like, God, dog it. <laughs> he cut it into chunks first, and took the knife, just run it off. I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> How did it hurry? I mean, 
It's just, it's brilliant. I mean, it's so much faster. You, what, are you trying to make up for the prank that you pulled on me? Yeah. <laughs> Throw your bone, baby. <laughs> but once you do that, you know, once you get your bonitas cut up, dry them, real, get them really good and dry, salt them, just... Morton table salt, man. Think of it, it's like thirty-seven cents. Salt the pig, salt the heck out of them. The more you salt them, once you freeze them, the tougher they get. Much, you know, the mingos aren't so bad, but man, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but a lot of my people that I got, they drop it down at the bottom, and I watch the rod tip go. Dip, dip. I'm like, dude, you need to reel up. You don't have any bait. He goes, no, I just got to the bottom. I said, no, you don't have any bait. I watched him take it. Um, and they'll sit there for about five or ten minutes, and these people over here catch two or three fish, and he finally reels up. He doesn't have any bait, and he goes. Wow, I don't have any bait. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. <laughs> and, and you guys have, have probably fished with Bonita before. You know how, like, especially with those smaller triggers, when they're picking up off all the red meat, you know how hard it is to get the skin off of the hook anyway. So I think for a lot of anglers, it gives people more than one shot yeah. at, a, at a fish. So I, I agree with you that that's by far my favorite bait. Yeah. Salted bonita, and, and if you'll vacuum seal it just like you do your fish that you're going to eat, you know, gosh, you'll keep in the freezer well, for a year. Normally, my favorite bait for mango. And then, you know, there's two types of squid that we sell at the store we have squid strips and we have whole squid. I despise whole squid. Whole squid's disgusting. It's slimy. It makes your hands peel. It my gets the fingers, black my stuff fingers all will be like your boat. this big around. Um, and it's much softer. The squid strips, they're much more durable. Um, I think we get just as good a bites on squid strips as we do on whole squid that we cut up. What about tentacles? <laughs> The tentacle part is a little tougher, but I still have to deal with all that black goo and <laughs> slime gross. and everything else. And, you and, know, and I'm the only one who ever washes the boat. Oh. So if you leave that black stuff on the boat, <laughs> Tim, I didn't know. Forever. You don't know what a brush is. Don't get don't tell me that. The other day I, I picked them up. We were going offshore and I was like, hey, and we had people on the boat with us. And I was like, hey, guys, just want to introduce you to Tim. But Tim, I want to show you something that I don't think you've ever seen before. I, it's it's really it's one of my favorite tools on the boat. And I pulled out the brush and I was like, you, you use it like this. And the people are just looking at him. So you're on you're on a roll tonight. But no, Tim, on my boat, what Tim normally does is find whole squid and then leave it out in the sun, maybe in the splash well somewhere where it's just like inking out all over the the white boat well it's not nearly as bad as what i did to my wife Ooh, this one's good so you know for all you ladies out here that married a redneck we can do a lot of things we can fix stuff we can <laughs> feed y'all we can hunt and fish well i had the bright idea this was way this <laughs> a long time ago it was before we, you know now you can go and buy um procure scents and stuff and put on your baits. Well, we didn't have scents back then. Well, I wanted scents for my lures. Well, I took a one of them little plastic tubs with a regular squid and I stuck it up on the roof and left it up there for about two weeks till it got really good and fermenty. And I'm sitting in the garage, my wife's inside watching TV and I have her food processor out there, processor out there and I put the squid in there and I'm I'm making me some scent. Well, that scent had made its way into the house. Well, anyway, I have a food processor now for the garage and she has a food processor. <laughs> <laughs> but that black, that squid stuff, it, it is awful. really bad. That's, you know, I think the squid strips work better, plus they're not messy. Um, you can cut up, you know, ballyhoo, cigar, man, his herring, but there again, they get that off really easy. Um, the one other bait that I that we really like with a lot of times fishing with clients, it's the most durable of all, but it's by, it's also the most expensive, and that's fish bites. Uh, they make two products: there's fish bites and fish gum. But the fish bites, it has a little mesh stuff in the middle of it, um, and it's very very durable a lot of times they can uh the clients can get bit two or three maybe even four or five times and 
they'll finally catch the fish because the trigger fish and the mingos can't get that off as fast. And it's in a sealed package. So for me, I keep a whole bunch of it on my boat just in case. Like what if we run out of, or if I can't find a bonita or something, or if we run out of squid, probably throw one of those on. Yeah. So just a question on the other bait, like the cut bait you had right before that. Yep. The other valley hoop. Um, do you dry it and salt it too? You can. You can. Back in the day, like what? Well, yeah, the, the question was, should we do the ballyhoo if we're going to use it as cut bait, dry and freeze and salt it too? Definitely. Back when I was a kid growing up on a charter boat, um, we had to be, we were real frugal about things and a bait that nobody ever fishes with hardly anymore at all. But we would get 55 pound flats of ladyfish and we would cut them up and we would take a five, we always had three or four five gallon buckets on the boat somewhere. It's layer of salt, layer of um, ladyfish, layer of salt, layer of ladyfish, almost kind of like making kimchi, I think. And then you put a lid on it and you stick it down in the hole of the boat. Just let it, just leave it down there for several months and it would dry and oh, you, you, you'd have to have a pair of scissors to get the last piece off at the end of the day. That's a super, super good bait, but it's a lot of trouble if you know, you need to let it sit in that bucket of salt for at least three or four months. Well, I, I don't know what's next on your slides, but how big of a piece? You don't, not much bigger than the end of your thumb. End of your thumb. You know, if you give them too big a piece of bait, they're going to grab it and try to just pull it off the hook. You want the bait big enough to attract them, but not so big that when they bite it, you want it to have the hook in them. Yeah, I'm just looking at the handout that you guys have, and those are all keeper mingos. Those are decent, I mean, what, 15-inch mingos on the front? Yeah. Look at how small their mouth is. So, I mean, it's, as far as hook size goes and the piece of the bait, you're trying to get it in that fish's mouth so you don't want to strip or anything like i think even this is probably a little big that's i think that was one from tuna fishing but i just used it as a, a yeah. cut bait picture i think a lot of people fish with baits that are too big Ooh, <laughs> um a lot of people saw that picture. Yeah, well, we're going to go, go back and talk for, safety here. For people minute. watching on the internet, I don't know if anybody heard that, but there was a collective, ooh. <laughs> so before we talk, uh, kind of before we move on to some of the closing things and talk a little bit about safety and a few other things and that we want to talk about tonight, do we have questions on actual rigging, baits, how-to, where-tos? Yes, sir. I missed the hook size you guys were talking about. Something about, he, the question was, what about hook size? About the size of a nickel. Don't worry about the one-aught, four-aught, physical size about a nickel. I have a question for you. Is that the whole hook or just the hook? The, the, this, the whole hook. I have a question for you. I'm looking for mingos. I know I've got a couple numbers of Rex. I've got a chicken coop or two and I've got some reef stuff. Where would you go look for mingos? I'm going to a reef structure first. Not a wreck? Normally you go to a wreck and you get eaten up by snappers. I mean, if you go to a wreck, there's gonna, red snapper can be very, very aggressive. And I've had days where you keep running down a two hook rig and you just keep catching <laughs> two red snapper, two, two big red snappers at a time. Well, I mean, red snappers are easy, they're stupid. They're not nearly as smart as trigger fish. More questions? Yes, sir. You have to find that uh, fluoro might be superior to mono when you make your uh, chicken rigs. So the gentleman asked it, fluoro or mono? And what pound? So I normally start with 60 pound and I work down from there. Really? I didn't know you fish that heavy. I just like it because when you're doing the de-hooking part, you never break the rig. Um, there are days that you have to work your way. If you're fishing really shallow water, you might want to start with 40. If you're fishing under 75 feet, I probably would start with 40. Um, and 
like I say, I normally start with 60 and I end up with 40 and I may end up all the way down to 30 pound test. As far as fluorocarbon goes, fluorocarbon is great for anything that we're going to do way up in the water column. Normally, if we're fishing any kind of depth, once you get out there past about 100 feet deep, not enough light at the bottom to make a difference. You can save, that's something you can save money on. Use that for when you're going to chum for red snappers or fish for blackfin tunas and mahis. Much better off using fluorocarbon, using that then and saving a little bit of money. Just use regular old everyday Andy monofilament. And for me as a charter captain, and I don't work for the tackle shop, so you cover your ears because I'm going to tell you how to save more money on these. Um, you can buy pre-made two hook rigs or you can tie them yourself. It's pretty easy. I'll buy whole spools. So not just the leader spools, but the actual, like, I don't know how many yards are on. They're quarter pound spools. Quarter pound spools, but they fit perfectly in a koozie. So people have koozie. I mean, you, I'm sure some- Everybody you, has a kitchen drawer. One of you guys might drink a beer or two every now and then, I'm not sure, but everyone's got koozies. Those leader spools, or I'm sorry, not leader spools, those actual monofilament, Quarter, quarter pound roll fit perfectly in a koozie and then the tag end will come out and you can just pull it straight out tie a couple rigs put them in and i for me on the boat with people everywhere i'll tie them i'll tie a dozen of them one day when it's rainy put my hooks on them have my swivels on it put it in a bag and throw it in my my boat so if somebody does break off and i'll show you guys kind of the setup that i use at some point but if somebody breaks off or if somebody breaks a hook open or something it's kind of like hey unclip that here's another one just clip this on and put your weight on and just keep keep going but those that koozie trick i should i should make 38 light tackle koozies or something my leader material or my leader holders or something like that um but I think I that's think a, we sell more koozies at the store for that than we do for drink holders. Yeah, sure. I don't know anybody who would use it for a beer. <laughs> if your beer lasts long enough to do you need a koozie, you need to learn how to drink. That's all I'm saying. Um, so back to this picture. I heard in the crowd, I heard a been there, done that. Turn to get rid of that picture. <laughs> that's that's actually. Let's talk about it now. That's actually my hand. Um, one of my clients did that to me last year. And if for any of y'all that don't know the trick, you know, you, you need to get that hook out. So you got to push it back through before you can clip it off. Well, the trick to that is get you a five gallon bucket of ice, get out of the fish box, get, get some water, you know, get some salt water put in there. The salt water will lower the temperature. Stick your hand in the bucket. Uh, I don't know how long I have my hand in there, three to five minutes. So I just couldn't take the pain of the cold anymore. And then we were able to push the hook out. Unfortunately, we didn't have the bolt cutters with us that day and we almost didn't get it cut out. Buy you a cheap, I mean, we sell them at the store. They come in like an eight inch and a 14 inch pair of bolt cutters. They're like 17 and $25. That's a safety item that you need to have on your boat. I've got a good pair of compound dikes on the boat. Um, and I think on your story, you, they were just regular single hinge dikes. Yeah. I think you, you said they had to like put them on. And I wasn't there because I would have been, oh, let me just pull it out, Tim. Yeah. Just hold yeah, still. Just pull just, a but, circle hook. Yeah, I would have been just pulling on it. Um, but I think you said they had to like put one handle. They put one of the handles on the gunnel and had to press on it because they couldn't squeeze tight enough to pop it. And the people, I, it was one of my regular clients that take fishing all the time. And they, ha, they have two little boys, and they have a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 13-year-old. That's who we normally fish with. But we had all their uncles with us that day and they were all in their mid to upper 80s. And I didn't know if they were ever gonna get to fish again. So I was dead set on <laughs> having a really good day. And we almost had our limit when they got the hook in me. And uh, one, one of the uncles was like, well, I guess we got to go home now. I said, no, y'all got to catch me four more snappers. Wow. Now I'm going to have a Diet Coke and a piece of fried chicken. <laughs> and then we can go home. That looks like a big old mustache. It, like. it was a seven out owner Mutu light. So one free tip too that I'm very proud of for thinking of. I thought the Bonita one was, I mean, we did that out of necessity. I wasn't really even thinking about that, but 
one that I came up with one day that I was very proud of. Um, a lot of you guys, especially as fishermen, you have vacuum sealers at the house. You may not need these often or a screwdriver or hose clamps or anything. Um, and I actually only came up with this because I was a broken down boat off the pass and I didn't want to, this was during the rodeo, but I, nice guy, he was actually beating us uh, in the rodeo, but I mean, it's boating. You are supposed to go help somebody. He had his cowling off and I just kind of went by like, Hey, you're close enough. Like you guys are safe. I hope your boat's having trouble so that I can go out and try to win this. But also how can I help? Like, let's make sure you guys can get back in. Um, and I said, Hey, I've got some hose clamps. I've got some tools and I pulled them out and they were pretty rusty. And my screwdriver, he tried to use and it broke. And I said, I'm not doing this again. And as an engineer, I was a little embarrassed. I was like, I'm not doing this. I vacuum seal my tools now. So it's hard to do because I think vacuum sealers like moisture to, to come out. But if you vacuum seal those, you may never need them. I hope you never need them. But when you do, they're probably going to be a little shiny and nice and I guess safer, more hygienic or something. Yeah. Um, but just a interesting tip. Another little thing that's really helpful on the boat because somebody somebody's always getting cut with a knife. Um, sometimes you see them at CVS, but not very often. But Amazon always has them. They're little zip stitches. They're like little tiny zip ties. It sticks on you, and you just pull the little zip ties, and they pop off. You can stitch yourself up while you're out there. Um, they're not expensive. It's just something you need to throw in your first aid kit. And some kind of like, like hand sanitizer will hurt if you have a cut that hurts. But some some kind of. Um, so tell us about so returning as far as the timeline goes uh there was a law pat or legislator legislature man passed that was tough uh, yeah i had a hard time with that you, you uh, i should have had more pizza i should have uh, had more rum in that cup <laughs> legislature passed um that requires people reef fishing and i may be wording this wrong but anyone reef or bottom fishing um, has to have either a vent tool or a descending device on the boat um, now when you pull up fish they have barrow trauma it's they don't you know i mean i'm sure all you guys have caught a snapper that didn't swim away and you kind of felt bad about it but there's a group that's funded called return them right who offers for a what a 10 minute or 15 minute video it's about 10 minutes you watch this little video um and they'll send you the kit mark's going to tell you about they will send you a device called the sequelizer which is basically a yeah a boga grip uh, that has a little knob on the bottom to set to 50 100 or 150 feet and this three pound lead and this three-way swivel they'll send you the whole kit for free uh, it's a hundred dollar value, but it's pretty cool. Once that device reaches the water pressure of 50, 100 or 150 feet, it'll release that grip and let that fish will swim away. So it's kind of cool. I mean, it, and then you get a lot of people talking about conservation and we're huge on kill. If you're going to kill it, only keep what you're going to eat. I, I, for me, it's, it's a sensitive subject because I have so many people on my boat that are on vacation that may be flying home the next day. And it's like, okay, what do you need 80 pounds of snapper for that? You're going to, what are you going to do? You're not going to fly home with it. What are you doing? Um, and I think if you're a recreational fisherman and you fish maybe once a summer or once a week, yeah, sure. You're probably going to eat all that. But if you go fishing every day, like me, you start to kind of feel bad of, we're catching a lot of fish. So especially this time of year, when you know, when you're looking for mingos and triggers, you're probably going to find a red snapper and you're supposed to have something to help take care of them. There's something to be said about just kind of taking that fish and going, well, sorry, and then watch them get eaten by a dolphin or something, or maybe just taking two extra seconds, cl clipping the device to them and toss them over the side. But again, it's a completely free program and they'll send you all that stuff for free. And I do have a stack of cards that have a QR code on the back that'll take you directly to that website to fill out that form uh, if you guys want to grab one of those. And for me, I mean, the three pound lead 
is pretty heavy for me fishing on spinning gear. I mean, of course, it'll help let that grouper go back to the bottom and swim away, but it's pretty hard to reel up a three pound lead on one of these. Um, do you have anything in there about rods and reels and, and rigs? No, because I kind of figured that almost anything really works. I completely agree. But I mean, I don't think you have to have, like a lot of the things that we do, it's kind of specialized. I don't think with this, so long as it's light enough that your rod and reel is light enough to, in the tip that you can feel the bite, I don't really think it matters. You know, you don't have to go and buy something special. This is not like Wahoo Dolphin trolling. You don't have to go out and buy something that's greatly expensive. Well, you know, I don't, I don't think you have to for that either. <laughs> you know this story i'm talking about but what i do i i like to run i'm getting all tangled up i i like to run i like to fish with spinning gear all my bottom stuff i brought uh, most of the rods that i generally take out on the boat but i like using the same kind of combo for as many different things as i can whether i'm catching snappers uh, groupers, amber jacks, and this is light gear for some of that, but tunas and wahoo. I mean, we even caught the wahoo that won the rodeo on this. Um, 60 pound fluoro and a circle hook while we were trying to catch black fin tunas. Now, I wouldn't recommend that, but I don't want to. And, and for those who don't know me, I only I bought my boat and just started fishing. I, I didn't grow up here. I traveled for a living and I was lucky that I got to fish all over the place. And when I ended up here, I was like, I want to just fish how I fish. Like we vertical jigged in Japan. And I was like, well, why can't we jig here? And everybody was like, well, do you drop a eight ounce lead with a live cigar at the bottom and you catch snapper. And I'm like, why can't I drop a jig? And they were like, no, you don't do that. You drop a cigar man. I was like, well, why? And everybody was like, you have to bottom fish with conventional gear. And I was like, I'm gonna bottom fish with this. If it doesn't work, I just, I'll learn it the hard way. But I try to keep, I just try to have a little bit more fun and try to use the same rod for as many things as I can. So I'll run braided line. I like this Power Pro Depth Hunter because it's metered and every 25 feet it changes colors. And I believe there's a tick mark on it, a little black tick mark every five. So you can really, so for me on the boat, if you, if I looked at you and I was like, hey, drop it down 55 feet. You'd go, how do I know? I'm like, well, drop it until it turns orange. <laughs> and then one black mark and you're like, oh, well, that makes it easy, but it, it helps a lot. Um, I run braided line, I have this bead on there just to keep people from reeling my metal up into the rod tip. And I use these duo lock snaps. I use these snaps a lot to change out rigs. So whether I'm putting a actual snapper rig on or if I'm using a chicken rig like this, it just lets me use the same combo for as many different things as I can. And a lot of guys are like, oh, that's too much terminal tackle. It's too much hardware. We catch plenty of fish. We get a lot of people too who, who call me out on, and I didn't even bring one of my casting rods, um, using quick disconnects on my jigs and stuff like that. And I'm sure there's somebody in here who's like, nah, it's too much tackle. I'm like, I catch a lot of fish. I'm not worried about how much metal is on here. Um, one other thing too that I just thought of by looking at this, when you talk about making rigs and actual bottom rigs, one thing you didn't mention is this distance. Yeah, I always wanted your hooks to be far enough apart that, so when you're traveling, you can hook the two hooks together and it pulls tight. That way you don't have free hooks swinging around the boat and nobody's going to get hurt with that. That and when you drop them, they're not going to tangle with each other because right. you can't catch a fish if these two things are connected to each other. And, but if, it, and if anyone doesn't know, like when you're fishing for other species, but you go out there to catch bait with your sabiki rigs, your sabiki rigs are made to where the two hooks can hook together. It's got six hooks on it. So two can hook, two can hook, and two can hook. That way you don't have sabiki hooks flying around everywhere. Yeah, just make sure you unhook them before you try to catch fish, because I've also done that where all my hooks were connected together, and I was like, why aren't we catching anything? <laughs> but what I will say is I like to drive fast between spots my boat likes to move. Um, but when we do, I just simply take the weight off and put these two hooks together and then either put the little loop on the handle or wrap the lead around the bottom just so that I can throw it in that rod holder 
and really go. I think we, we do a similar thing with our bottom gear just so that we don't have uh, sinkers swinging around while I'm driving full speed, not using my koozie for beers. So, Mingo and trigger fishing, hopefully I'll kind of think, got from us tonight. This is really pretty easy. And if you can take one thing away from tonight, is learning how to use your, your, your sonar system to be able to fish natural bottom and use the split screen functionality. Um, if it, this is more, uh, learning that and the Garmin um, relief shading. If you can take those two things home and learn from those, you will become much better at all your reef fishing species, not just mingos and triggers. Um, but those, that's the two things you re we really want you to take home from tonight. The rigging, the bait, and that kind of stuff, that's not as important. If you, if you fish with 100 pound leader or 20 pound leader, it wouldn't be nearly, it wouldn't change things nearly as much as not fishing the correct way and knowing how to read the bottom. 